Welcome everyone once again SDMFC's September convening dedicated to mental health and family wellness. I am Danny Romero with Say San Diego and the San Diego Military Family Collaborative and there is a great deal of wisdom in the room from you all plus the wonderful speakers that we have. So let's get started. Um, with regard to today, um, as I've mentioned, we have a sign-in sheet. Hopefully you're able to sign in. Um, always welcome to put information in the chat too, uh, but we would love for you to sign in so that if you do need anything else following, we'll have your email address. Um, with regard to uh, the PowerPoints that you have, it's just a reminder that you're always welcome to have um, you know, a, a copy of the PowerPoint following these convenings. All you have to do is just email myself or Mary we gladly will get that for you. So um, with that, please just keep an eye out on the chat box as we'll continue to leave information there as we go. Um, but with uh, today, I want to just remind folks that this month, 20, I'm sorry, this year, 2021 has been dedicated to moving military families forward. And what that means is, you know, really trying to uh, provide our programs and services and making sure that it's easy and accessible for military families to access things, you know, and to take out the, the middleman, so to speak, and make sure that information flows and uh, allows folks to navigate as easily as possible. So moving ahead. Um, want to shout out SEMFC membership. Uh, many of you are in this, uh, this square quadrant, and um, it's a reminder that next week's actually our next members only uh, training, and it's on motivating teams. And let's face it, it's been a challenging year, challenging year and a half with COVID. And I'm sure that many of you may have found that it's been difficult to remain engaged along the way. So we're hoping that um, the training uh, provides you an opportunity to get connected and find new ways of uh, obviously motivating your team. We would like for you to please save the date. Uh, October 22nd, which would typically be our convening date, is now going to be dedicated to our annual summit. Um, the uh, topic and focuses that we'll be getting into, uh, well, first of all, I should say that it's going to be in virtual format. Um, we will be celebrating our 11th annual summit, and it is open to the public. You can get connected yourselves, um, those that are in your circles and networks. And uh, more importantly, the topics that we're going to be examining are really going to be kind of the landscape of child care, actually, um, to see what is happening to help support military families, where there might be gaps and what's being done to address those gaps. And so we have great panelists along the way. There's really fun activities that we've been crafting via some online uh, engaging activities. So we're excited to have you enter our future uh, annual summit next month. Information drops next week. So stay tuned to our newsletters for that, as we'll have some nominal tickets, um, always trying to keep it open and available for military families to connect to uh, cost free. And um, for you DOD employees, there'll be ways of getting connected as well. Um, but when it comes to the annual summit, we're just really looking for contributions to continue to help our services grow. So, um, you know, stay tuned and look forward to that email coming shortly. Um, I was Without further ado, I'd like to allow Mary Alcocer, if you're not familiar with Mary, Mary is our AmeriCorps Vista for SDMFC. Mary will pre be presenting on Hispanic Heritage Month. Are there a few items you would like to share prior to me uh, queuing the video, Mary? No, that's okay. <laughs> okay. Well, here is a short video on Hispanic Heritage Month, and then uh, Mary will pick it up following. I am Puerto Rican. My mother came uh, born and raised from Puerto Rico, and my father is Hungarian, and so I like to think of myself as an all-around American with Latina heritage. So I was born in Puerto Rico, and my dad is from Venezuela, from South America. My mom is from Puerto Rico, but her heritage is from Spain. My heritage is Spanish, so my, my parents actually were were born and raised in Mexico as well as my grandparents that actually came 
Mexico. I am a Mexican American, so I grew up in Mexico. I was born in the United States, so that actually granted my citizenship. It's important for us to celebrate our backgrounds because that's what makes us unique, and especially with uh, Hispanic Heritage Month. Working with different cultures or backgrounds gives you an opportunity or an ability to see things from different perspectives. I think that it's important so that people understand that uh, even though we are the same human beings on Earth, we bring something different to the table. We can think differently. It's important to have all our strengths shine throughout our work to make sure that we get the mission done effectively and safely. Our experiences is what make us, make us uh, unique. And we bring all of those experiences to the table and we work together as a team. And with different backgrounds, we're uh, able to come up with different results and better results to uh, achieve our mission for our state and our federal mission. Good morning, everyone. Um, happy Friday. Uh, my name is Mary Alcocer. I'm a... Um, AmeriCorps Vista with State San Diego, and I'm helping out with the SDMFC. So um, I'm a Mexican American, and um, this month is kind of special for us Hispanic Latinos. Um, and uh, I'm gonna give you a kind of brief of what this month is about and why we celebrate it, what is so important for us to um, celebrate this month. Um, so it is started as a week, um, as a week, we just celebrated like a week, um, our former president um, Johnson in 1968, um, he was the one who started with this movement and um, to call out Hispanics and Latinos to be celebrated. That change in 1988, where uh, former President Reagan uh, passed the public uh, law where we were able to celebrate this month for 30 days. It starts September 15th and it ends on October 15th. And basically we aim to celebrate history, culture, and the positive impact of every Latino, every Hispanic in the country. And um, as, 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 as I was mentioning, so um, we are referring to all, um, citizens who came from and their ancestors are from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, uh, Central and South America. Uh, next slide, please. And why September 15? So this is very important to mention. So uh, many countries, um, they have their Independence Day on September 15th. Uh, for example, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, but also in September 16th, Mexico also has celebrates their Independence Day. Uh, Chile on September 18th and Belize September 21st. So the aim was to celebrate and to honor uh, this Independence Day and to honor everyone who has uh, positively impact in our country. So it pays tri tribute uh, to all generations, Hispanics and Latinos who have come to this country and they have earned their place in this country. They have uh, honor the country, they have worked for this country, they have, have their families and they have they are expecting a future or they have made a future in this country. They have the American dream in this country. Um, so that's why we celebrate it, we honor them. And Hispanics um, have contributed in America since the, the, the American Revolution and all the work since then. So it's very important for us to um, honor these people and honor these communities who at times might feel um, they are not uh, so, um, they are not together, but then with this um, month and these celebrations, um, we are inclusive and we are becoming just one country with different ethnicities. Thank you.
Thank you, Mary, for sharing. Obviously, this this year we've been doing our best to provide or highlight different um, different backgrounds, different causes with regard to um, the different months that are dedicated to different ethnic groups along the way. So um, obviously this is Hispanic Heritage Month and thank you for summing that up, Mary. Where we are is a reminder that we're gonna be going into kind of the convening. So we'll have a breakout room activity shortly. And you know during these breakout rooms, we remind you that if you can, uh, keep your video up to say hello to others as it's intended to be networking. Um, we would love to have you all connect and obviously get to know one another's work. So stay tuned for that shortly. But talking about today's icebreaker today will be Claudine Casillas, who is from KPBS and SDMFC's co-chair. Claudine. Good morning. Um, we have a great turnout today and I appreciate all of you for spending time with, with us and the collaborative this morning. Um, it is the third day of fall. I don't know what happened <laughs> so far in 2021. It's been a little bit of a blur. And as Danny has uh, mentioned today, you know, we're, we're going to be taking a look a little bit closer on mental health and um, keeping ourselves resilient um, through, you know, some of our most trying times. Um, but today we wanted to kind of ask as a, as a way to kick things off you know, how do you practice self-care? What are the things that you're doing, small and big, that kind of help keep you grounded and keep you positive and moving forward and resilient? So um, with that, that's going to be our, our task today as we break out into the into the different breakout rooms. How, how often do you practice self-care and what do you do? And maybe we can all learn from each other. Great, so what's gonna happen is that you're gonna be whisked away to a room where there'll be at least five other folks with you and we invite you to share on this question about self-care and then obviously take an opportunity to talk about you know, what you do, what your role is for that agency. If you're military connected, then great, um, but it's intended to have meaningful networking. So on your screen, you'll see an invitation to jump into a room about now. So happy connecting, you'll have about five minutes and I will. Shannon, can you hear me? Hey. Hi, how are you? Good. We're on the same room all the time. <laughs> I know. That's weird. Or <laughs> what a funny coincidence. I know. <laughs> that's so funny. Um, where's everybody else? I thought he said there was going to be five people. I know. Maybe they haven't joined. <laughs> I, know. I think we were quick. I think Danny was still kind of saying giving instructions and I like join so <laughs> oh yeah I know it's like we, we know the drill yes totally <laughs> are you completely um remote do you go into the office at all not not right now um so I sold to my car you know mm. an economic situation that we had um so I uh, yeah we, we only have one car, which is my boyfriend's, and that's the only one I'm, we're using. Um, so Danny told me, you know, you can stay remote, and whenever we need you at the office, that's that's what we'll do. Okay. Yeah. Um, where, what part of San Diego do you live in? Uh, San Isidro, very close to the border. Okay. Actually, very close to um, the Las Americas outlets. Mm. I've never been there. Are they good outlets? Yes. Yeah, it's kind of worth it. Yeah, they have a ton of things. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know if anybody else is joining. Um, no, it's just weird. And so, you know, you need to, you know, go walk the dogs, take a walk, something like that. So that, that's me. We lost Nathan. Okay. No, I'm still here. Oh. Yeah, I'm wearing wireless headphones so I can hear everything, even if I'm out of frame. But uh, well, I'll take the invitation and I'll go next. So, um, talking about my self-care practices, 
Um, I think my, my, uh, my partner and I enjoy a lot of quality TV together, both comedy and drama. Um, uh, I listen to a lot of uh, podcasts to keep myself stimulated. Um, my wife and I do some exercise classes together at home. And I do um, acro yoga, which is a kind of uh, partner acrobatics uh, as something that uh, is, is a nice uh, avocation for me. Um, and, you know, cooking sometimes and other things like that. But yeah, those are, those are some of the big ones. And uh, they, they definitely help. Oh, I guess uh, just a little introduction about me. Uh, I am um, a fairly new military family life counselor. Um, so I'm working on Naval Base San Diego. I'm just in my fourth week right now, but I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. And so I'm assigned to Naval Base San Diego. I'm currently assigned to uh, 10 different ships, but I also serve kind of a, a wider population on base. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to be doing it. Uh, I was a civilian in the Navy for 10 years previously for the Naval Health Research Center, topside in Point Loma. And uh, we did some deployment health research there. Um, but I'm, I'm definitely most passionate about being a clinician. So who's next? We have six people. Mary and I were in another room by ourselves. And, uh, that's why we're late to the game. Uh, we were like, I guess nobody else is coming. And then it, so I don't know who's already went, but I'll go since I unmuted myself. My name is Shannon Strasner. I'm with Safe San Diego. Um, I support the school-based resource center um, at Canyon Hills, right there in Murphy Canyon and Field Elementary. Uh, Self-care, I like to walk my dogs when it's not 100 degrees. Um, and I do hot yoga. It's weird. I won't walk them in the heat, but I will definitely go make put myself in a 95 degree place. Um, I love to bake when it's not hundred degrees because I don't have air conditioning at my house, but I love doing Gosh. that. I also listen to a ton of podcasts, um, and we have our shows on rotation that we have at like family happy hour on Fridays. Um, this is my plug for Ted Lasso. If you haven't watched it, it's on Apple TV. It is so good. It's brought such a bright spot during such a wild, confusing time. And it's. I could go on and on about it, but that's my plug for Ted Lasso for the day. Um, yeah. I'll go. Uh, hello everyone. So I'm Mary Alcocer and I was with Shannon in the other room. <laughs> We're like, okay, cool. Just waiting for the rest. Um, and uh, I'm with Say San Diego uh, under the American Visitor Program in self-care so i just came back from vacation two amazing weeks <laughs> um so that's why i'm still 10. Uh, i went to the mexican caribbean um so it was great always taking care of myself you know covid still out there and um so i'm quarantined uh, and i'm gonna um you know be home for 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 a bit um but i usually um love taking walks going to the uh doing exercise so i have like a very small gym at my house um so that's what i do i love watching um some um also series or quality tv uh documentaries that kind of thing um so yeah that's pretty much it and having a good sleep during the weekend. I don't know if um, the person on the phone, maybe. I, there's not much time left, so hopefully you can jump in. Has everybody else already went? Yeah, oh, okay. It's hard when you're on, has anybody ever called into a Zoom? It's like, it, it feels like a lot of, sometimes it can be like complicated and like by the time you figure out how to unmute, it's like, yeah. But we're happy you're here, person on the phone. 
it, it was nice to meet you guys and thank you for the recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. for everyone so hopefully you had an opportunity to meet someone new get connected and um yeah we'll just wait for everyone to come back from break 30 more seconds but i'm hoping that you can also share in the chat what are some new strategies or techniques that you actually um accomplish when it comes to self-care and so um, I know there's many of you who are creative and um, we would love to hear what that looks like for you. So once again, please use the chat sharing any of your best practices or, you know, something that might be insightful for all to enjoy when it comes to your own personal self care on um, what you might recommend anyone else. So that being said, I would like to have um, you once again to know that information from today today is all about mental health and family wellness is going to be captured in our fact sheet and you can find that information always on our uh stmfc website and you all just look for the months convening information and that's where that information resides so without further ado part of family wellness today we wanted to take an opportunity to talk to you about Kind of safety at home and so with that lori i think you're queued up and ready to go just let me know when you need me to move slides okay sounds good hi everybody um i actually just updated this slide by the way and it, the number is actually 5.4 million american children live in homes where guns are unlocked and, and loaded but um thank you uh daniel for the introduction um and thank you to everybody who's here in the interest of uh your families uh, Be Smart for Kids is dedicated to keeping kids safe from unintentional shootings, homicide, suicide by gun, and domestic violence. And as I just mentioned, uh, the, as the slide says, 5.4 million American children live in homes where guns are locked, uh, unlocked and loaded. And that number just went up because uh, since the coronavirus epidemic, uh, there has been a huge explosion in gun sales uh, and especially to first time owners who may not have the experience of uh, gun safety that more uh, experienced owners have. Uh, so Be Smart for Kids was launched in 2015 to raise awareness that responsible, secure gun storage can save children's lives. And secure gun storage means storing guns locked, unloaded, and separate from ammunition. So Be Smart emphasizes that it's always an adult responsibility to keep kids from accessing guns and that every adult can play a role in keeping kids and communities safe. So next slide, Daniel, please. So we are a national program. Um, we have over 3,000 trained volunteers who deliver the Be Smart message across the country. And since the beginning of the program, there have been over 6,500 events across all 50 states. Be Smart is non-political and non-partisan in nature, and we've been endorsed by the PTA at the national level. So the SMART in Be Smart stands for S, secure guns in homes and vehicles, M, model responsible behavior around guns, A, ask about the presence of guns in other homes, and that can actually be the most challenging um, because typically asking about guns in homes has not been a part of the safety conversations that we've had in the past, but it should be. Just like we ask about allergies or pets or screen time, asking about guns in the home um, can be life-saving and can be normal with practice. So then moving on to the R that stands for recognizing the role of guns in suicide. And most people who attempt suicide do not die unless they use a gun. And in fact, 90% of suicide attempts with a gun result in death, and it is the most fatal means of self-harm. So having a gun securely stored can prevent an impulsive act into turning into a fatal one. And as a matter of fact, the VA right now is reaching out about safe storage for this very reason. And they have several PSAs that have been airing. So maybe you've had the chance to see one of those. And then lastly, the T in SMART stands for tell. So tell others to be smart. 
So that's what we've been doing um, in pre-COVID times. We showed up in person to present our free 20 minute program for parents and we can present our material in either English or Spanish. And we can certainly do it by Zoom, which I've been probably doing for about 18 months now. Um, we've delivered our message to uh, PTA groups, civic and faith-based based organizations, and even to medical students at UCSD. And we are currently working with the Foster Adoptive and Kinship Care Education Program at Grossmont College to educate foster and adoptive parents about the importance of safe storage of firearms. Um, you can find out more, uh, you can go to this link to our national website and on there, there are uh, a number of different resource sheets and things that, you know, please feel free to, to share. And if you're interested in having a program here in San Diego, you can schedule the free program uh, for your organization. You can reach out to me at the email at the bottom of the slide or at my phone number, uh, which is 858-217-6505. And next slide. So we're also kind of getting out and about more in the community uh, with all the safety measures uh, being taken in mind. Um, so in October, we'll have a table at the Out of Darkness Walk, which uh, is for suicide prevention. And that's on Saturday, October 16th at Liberty Station. We'll also be participating in National Injury Prevention Day activities that take place during the month of November. So maybe we will see you in person soon. So I will put uh, the, the link to our website and also some of our resource sheets in the chat as well. So thank you, Daniel. And if you have any questions, let me know. Yeah, you're welcome actually to type any questions to Lori. You know, part of uh, family wellness is making sure that there's a safe home for, for youth and, you know, working with active duty families, it would be always advantageous to take an opportunity to remind, remind them of, you know, the different um, avenues that are there that someone can take care of a firearm at home. So uh, Be Smart is obviously an opportunity for them to get connected to more information. And so thank you again, Lori, for coming through. Um, oh, and you have a question as to when? Yeah. Uh, it started in 2015. So it's been about six or seven years now. Oh. So once again, please dig into their website uh, to find out more information. And when it comes to, you know, safety at home, you know, part of wellness is making sure once again that we are in a safe environment. So please take opportunities to secure the home. And I know that Right here, you'll see some additional information um, from Lori and her crew. And, you know, a lot of the did you knows are some things that actually struck uh, Mary and I when we were um, getting this presentation ready. And in terms of, you know, what you see up on the screen right now, uh, I think one of the, the statistics that uh, was, was mentioned, the nearly 350 children 17 and under gain access to a firearm and unintentionally shoot themselves or someone else. And, you know, sadly, that may not be something that you can go back in a time and fix. Mm -hmm. So having conversations ahead of time is what we're all about, making sure that prevention is there. So thank you again, Lori. Yeah, and I, I would mention one, one other website, which is it's up to us SD, um, which has uh, a page about a prevention of firearm suicide, and they will give a lot of information about the legal aspects of, you know, how you might uh, possibly take your guns out of the home if that's another alternative or, um, you know, they'll give you more ideas for safe storage. So I'll, I'll put a couple of those links in the chat as well. So. Well, thank you again, Lori. Thanks. So as we move and talk more about, you know, uh, family wellness, safety, um, one of the aspects that oftentimes gets overlooked is mental health. And, you know, with where we are in the calendar year, September is also dedicated to mental health awareness or suicide prevention month. Um, and so we have Laura coming through from SD CHIP um, talking about suicide prevention councils. So Laura, are you able to unmute? Yes, thanks so much, Danny. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Laura Cannon. I'm the program manager with uh, San Diego County Suicide Prevention Council. We're facilitated by CHIP, and we are a local uh, nonprofit here in San Diego with a number of programs. And the Suicide Prevention Council is one of them. 
Um, and similar to the San Diego Military Family Collaborative, we are a convening as well of different partners and stakeholders with a mission to prevent suicide. So um, in fact, Lori is one of our, um, our co-chairs for one of our groups. So I'll uh, talk a little bit more about that. But uh, next slide, please. So just a little bit of a background of, as to who we are, how we got started. Um, we started back in 1999 as an unfunded work group. And in 2010, the County of San Diego um, actually awarded CHIP a contract to develop a suicide prevention action plan. So a document specific to San Diego on how we prevent suicides. And over the years, uh, we've kind of grown in kind of our reach and our capacity. Um, and in 2011, that was our formal establishment as the council. Um, but in 2018, we made an update to that plan. And on the figure you see on the right hand is what we are typically now uh, using to prevent suicides. This is called our wheel. We have nine specific strategies related to suicide prevention. And we envision everybody in San Diego to find themselves in the wheel. Um, whether you're working on integrating and coordinating activities, whether you're working on training and education, um, reducing access to lethal means, uh, we really want to find the steps and ways in which we can get everybody involved in suicide prevention, um, as we believe suicide prevention is everybody's business. Uh, next slide, please. Now, and just to give a little bit of more context about suicide in San Diego, we do have 2020 numbers. Um, and uh, as Danny mentioned, you know, Suicide Prevention Month is this September. Um, so we wanted to um, highlight some of the kind of offerings that we have as far as data and information goes. Um, so uh, I don't know, for at least me, it was a little surprising to actually do see a decrease in the number of suicides in 2020. So 419 suicides, we do see the gender breakdown right there. Um, more males are dying by suicide than females. And then we have that age range, 10 to 96. So it's definitely something that happens um, across the age spectrum and something that we really wanna consider um, you know, as we are working with family wellness. Um, but in addition to some of the suicide data that we do have available, we put out a report to the community every year um, in the beginning of September. And this year, we released this report card on September 8th on the status of suicide in San Diego. And although we did see a decrease in the number of suicides, that's not to say we want to remain um, kind of, uh, we want to still keep our finger on the pulse as far as understanding, hey, things might be happening a um, little bit later and just wanted to kind of highlight that. Um, and this year's report focuses on healthcare coordination capacity. So we do want to thematize um, each report uh, with an aspect of suicide um, as it is very complex. Um, it's not one size fits all and there's a number of ways at which uh, suicide has to be addressed. Um, and I'll go ahead and talk a little bit more on the next slide about some of the efforts. Now, um, similar to this group, we do have monthly convenings um, on the fourth Tuesday of each month. I know that lands on the uh, members only training next week, next week, but uh, we do still have opportunities in the future. Uh, we meet from 10 a.m. to 1130 with about 40 to 50 individuals in attendance. Uh, we have eight active subcommittees. As we know, um, suicide can um, really affect and impact different kind of aspects of the entire lifespan. So we have subcommittees dedicated to working with media working with faith institutions, higher education, schools um, with postvention, and um, one that might be very applicable to this group is priority populations and communities. So those groups that are at a higher risk for suicide. And then one of the other ways in which we also get involved, um, we aren't a direct service organization, but we do go out and provide training. So uh, we have free trainings. Um, they come in uh, different uh, shapes and sizes, um, if you will. I know in the past we've worked with Canyon Hills, formerly Sarah High School, on uh, what I wish my parents knew to provide QPR trainings to youth, students, teachers, and parents. Uh, we also provide um, more of a fuller um, presentation and training to, um, say, individuals who have a little bit more um, wanting to learn a little bit more about the intervention style, which is applied suicide intervention skills training. And we also provide trainings to other community groups as well, such as first responders and pharmacists. Next slide, please. And then what can you do to help? So there's many ways in which you can get started with suicide prevention and it can be very small as to just talking about it openly, similar to how we talk about uh, physical health and how we are you know, doing day to day. Um, you know, mental health is something that we wanna normalize um, and you know, bring out of the shadows um, so that there isn't stigma uh, because what we wanna do is understand that resources are there and uh, we can support others. Um, and we really wanna empower folks to reach out if you um, do need help um, for somebody that you care about, or even yourself. 
I'm glad that the um, activity today was talking about self-care and noting that, you know, it's okay not to be okay. And then um, San Diego is very rich in resources and we wanna really highlight that. Uh, one of the kind of easiest and simplest ways that you can get involved with suicide prevention is by just taking a training, understanding the warning signs to suicide, um, how one um, can recognize those signs and help someone in need. And we also have opportunities to be, um, to have individuals become instructors. So if this is something of um, a passion of yours or something that you wanna do and bring out to other communities. I know for a lot of folks, it's really um, integral to have somebody you know, within your own community delivering uh, the presentation materials. We actually provide sponsorship and scholarship opportunities um, to have individuals trained in the curriculum. And with that, you would get to learn the warning signs and resources available. And then we also are open to welcoming other folks to have others involved with our work. And even if you couldn't um, really find yourselves just quite yet in the wheel or um, need a little bit more of a further or uh, firmer grasp on what we do as a suicide prevention council, we're always open to having meetings one-on-one -on -one and finding out ways in which we can kind of uh, connect and collaborate. So that's something that we offer within our council. Next slide. And then I believe this is the last slide, but. Um, what we really want to do is just highlight the resources out there. Um, so I uh, know that this might be very familiar to you all, but we have our San Diego Access and Crisis Line, 888-724-7240. Something as simple as just programming it into your phone uh, can make all the difference in case you, know, you do find yourself in a position where you know, somebody might be in crisis and or if you just aren't having a really great day, you can actually call this number in a non-emergency capacity so that you can talk to somebody about, say, somebody that you're concerned about, or if you just want to find some resources. Um, Lori mentioned this earlier, but um, the website, um, it's up to us, up to sd.org, not only includes kind of the firearm safety and suicide tab, but a number of other resources that you can learn about mental health um, for students, youth, um, older adults, um, it kind of uh, covers it all. Um, our Suicide Prevention Council, www.spcsandiego.org is listed there too. If you wanna learn more uh, through our website, connected with me and the team. And then lastly, of course, 211 as another resource that you can um, also share to others. But um, I appreciate the time today acknowledging suicide during Suicide Prevention Month. And um, I can include all my information into the chat as well if you wanna get connected and learn more. Um, but thank you for the opportunity to present today. Thank you, Laura. So we're going to actually open it up for any Q&A for either Lori or Laura, the L squad today. Um, so I'm going to start with some, some basic questions and then invite you to put in the chat some more. Um, but with, uh, with that being said, um, you know, with suicide prevention, obviously a very serious topic. That's why we're addressing it today. I um, would like to know if, if either of you two uh, can just share um, when it comes to mental health, what are you seeing for those who are, you know, um, trying to create a plan or craft a plan? Are there any warning signs that in general the audience should be aware of? And, and how, are, how do you feel like the, uh, it might manifest, uh, their mental health might be manifested, um, you know, for, for any of these warning signs about suicidal ideation? I can start off with that uh, question. So um, I'll just take 2020 um, as an example. I know that was a very difficult year for many people. Um, and, you know, when it comes to suicide, it's not going to be, you know, maybe one event or one aspect that causes someone to um, think suicide is the only option. It's a culmination of factors. Um, in the training that we do, um, I kind of use the example of the game Jenga. So um, if you've ever played that before, you take out a block, um, you put it on the, the top of the tower, and then block by block, the tower gets less stable and it topples over. Um, and then we um, really let folks know that that's um, kind of similar to suicide, where it's a culmination of factors. So, you know, uh, you know, losing one's job might be a warning sign, but it might be coupled with the fact that um, they no longer feel like they can, um, you know, put food on the table. Maybe they're facing eviction, maybe a tra another traumatic event happened in their life. Um, and then all that to say, you know, there's just a number of signs that can indicate um, that one might not be doing well. So mental health, um, you know, somebody might have, you know, um, a diagnosis of a mental illness, but, you know, it has to be coupled with probably a number of other factors that might indicate suicide is there. And with that, uh, with the training, what we want to do and educate folks on is, you know, you want to ask directly. 
Um, similar to what Lori said about asking about firearms directly, you wanna ask about suicide directly. Um, you won't be planning the idea in someone's head. You're actually, um, you know, finally addressing something that they might, might've been hiding. So um, that's just like a little snippet of what we teach in usually our QPR trainings, but um, that's how, you know, we would probably recommend, you know, sharing right away, you know, what can one do um, to address that? Thank you, Laura. I, Go for it, Lori. Yeah, well, I think we've also started to focus more on what we call means reduction because oftentimes suicide might be an impulsive act. And I, I think the research has shown that the impulse can maybe pass in 10 to 20 minutes. And if somebody can easily access their uh, a weapon in their home, then you know that time doesn't get to work. It's it's magic, and maybe you know let something pass. So, especially as kids get older, you know you may have certain means of storing things, and you might have to reassess because maybe you know the uh, cable lock that you've had on your gun was fine when your kids were smaller, but as they get older, they get more uh, ingenious about things and maybe you need to think about investing in a gun safe or something like that. So uh, I, I think that's been, uh, you know, to, to try to just get the means out of the way to, to prevent these terrible things. Thank you, Lori. Um, I know we got a question. Oof, we got a, we got two questions. I did have selfishly one more that I wanted to ask Laura before I jump over to the chat box. And it was the fact that you had mentioned um, the trend. And I felt like that was a very interesting trend that you had mentioned with regard to suicides uh, over the, the last year, which obviously a lot of social isolation um, due to COVID conditions. And so do you have any, I mean, I know it's likely early, um, but do you have any thoughts as to why that trend may have looked like that? Yeah, um, so I actually do have um, a fuller presentation that our epidemiologist at the county um, provides every June. So I dropped it into the chat, but um, one of the slides actually shows the effect of the pandemic. And uh, during the March and April uh, periods, uh, you saw a really big dip in the number of suicides compared to previous months um, in uh, other years outside of the pandemic. So I think the lockdown actually just kind of uh, became this, you know, fight or flight, you know, there's a lot, um, there's something else that is top of mind for many others. And um, that actually contributed to a large dip. However, you know, as you know, folks are were able to kind of transition into that new normal, you know, then mental health and anxiety, depression, other um, uses for, you know, substances and alcohol increased as well. Um, so it's just kind of that period of uh, that um, fight or flight, I believe, um, that might have been a, the contributing factor. That's just, you know, something that we've kind of deciphered in some of the data, but I did include onto the chat um, that data presentation, which includes um, more of the numbers. Thank you for doing that. And, and there is one follow-up, which leads right directly from the chat. So um, with the suicide number breakdowns that were shared with the age of 10 to 80 uh, completion rates, is there, are there any trends um, with youth, um, in particular children, during increased, um, in, in, in this time during the pandemic, um, in terms of increased in attempts? Um, to your knowledge, Laura? Yeah, so we don't have attempt suicide numbers. Um, so the 10 to 18 um, age range actually is kind of the lowest out of the, the others. So um, as it trends older, that's when the rates actually increase, but that's not to say that their uh, youth and um, children 10 to 18 are at risk. Um, it's just the rate in which folks um, and, and children are dying by suicide. Um, but compared to previous years, there's a slide specifically on the youth trends. Um, it's actually very similar. So around kind of the number 20 um, has been the, the case for uh, suicides in ages 10 to 18. And unfortunately, that's been trending um, kind of upwards over the years. So I believe that number used to be kind of more in like the 10 or um, under 10 range, and it's been um, increasing to 20 over the years. But um, that data presentation that I did um, include on there, it has that slide. And if you have it open, I believe it's slide 26. Thank you. I'm gonna drop one more question and then go back to the chat box. So the question that I have is um, with regard to, to both of you, <clears throat> I'm not saying that there's anything specific about San Diego, but sometimes there is. Um, so the question that I have is 
In terms of what you're seeing here locally, how are you seeing that compare itself to what may be happening on a federal or federal landscape? So um, are you seeing, you know, our numbers uh, at the, you know, the current averages are uh, coinciding with the national averages or does that look different? So both Lori and Laura. I'm trying to think, Laura, isn't the, uh, the California rate, I think, is lower than the national rate, if I have that correct. And then, but I think San Diego rate is a bit higher than the California rate. Is, do I have that correct? Yes. So the San Diego rate is higher than the California rate. However, we're actually lower than the national rate. Uh, we've actually seen a, um, a decrease in the last two years. And the thing about San Diego um, compared to the others, um, is we actually get our data um, a lot sooner and quicker than um, national and um, statewide rates. So we have 2020 numbers available, but um, for national and statewide, um, we still are only comparing it to 2019. But um, that's been kind of the trend lately is we've always been a little bit higher than Cal California. Um, we used to be higher than national, but we've actually seen national growing the last few years. Great, so I'm gonna have one, one of the questions uh, shared. Um, so this is for Lori. Do you have any suggested ways to ask about firearms? And you know, remembering kids were, when kids are younger and did sleepovers, I'm sure that some parents may want to have you know, a conversation with the other parents in terms of the safety at the home. So any suggestions you have in terms of having that conversation, Lori? Yeah, I'm sure. It is a good question because my kids are grown and I didn't typically ask. Um, but the good news is that as we talk to people out in the public, I find that younger parents are starting to make it a part of their safety conversation. And what we suggest is that you include it with the other things that you would typically ask about. So um, my son is allergic to dairy products. So I would always ask, you know, are you what are you having for lunch? And, you know, kind of finding out about that or if they have allergies or if there'll be pets in, in the home. And as they get older, of course, exposure to maybe alcohol or you know what parents are gonna be home. So there are things that we typically ask that um, you know, we don't feel uncomfortable about just kind of putting that into context with all of those. And the other suggestion that Be Smart gives is maybe maybe you do it by text or you do it by email at first, you know, because maybe that would be less uncomfortable than having a face-to-face -face conversation about it. But I, I also had another colleague that used to blame her, her own kids in a way. And, and it's true. She would say, you know, my, my son is so curious and I just, you know, I just want to make sure that everything is safely stored because I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't want any safety problems. So, you know, she kind of put it on herself rather than put them in a defensive mode. Thank you for sharing. I mean, and it sounds like from the both of you that we could all at least, uh, you know, take take a note that sometimes it's important to be direct and to have those conversations. So uh, that's at least one one definite takeaway for me. The last uh, question that I have before we go to break, unless anyone else has any other questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat. But um, last question I have for both of you is that, you know, SDMFC is all about education, advocacy, and engagement. And so the A of, of the EAE is uh, advocacy. So I would like to ask, you know, when it comes to policies or policy making around some of the things that you're both working on, are there any things that we should be aware of in terms of upcoming bills or anyone who's a champion of the work here locally that we should also be mindful of? Thing that comes to mind is I know um, part of the family aspect is um, you may all be parents or have um, students or work with youth um, and there is a assembly bill that has been passed for the last few years now about uh, suicide prevention policies in California and each school is actually required to have a suicide prevention policy in place which um, not only covers the staff but then students and parents um, so I take, uh, you know, take the time to maybe even if you are involved with your schools or work with schools directly to see what that plan is in place. So we go out and do a lot of these trainings for these, um, these campuses and these 
um, school systems so that, you know, they have that training and background for their staff so that, you know, if a, if a suicide does occur, um, the, uh, the school is prepared. So um, this is both for not only now uh, 7th through 12th graders, but also K through, um, K through 6 as well. Um, and then the other thing that we're closely monitoring is the national lifeline. So I know there's been talks of uh, there being a phone number uh, rather than the national lifeline, which is a couple digits long, um, that might not be the most easy to remember. Um, it's now the 988 number. So uh, we're still kind of monitoring, you know, what the rollout looks like. But I remember, if, correct me if I'm wrong, Lori, that it has passed and it's now just kind of uh, uh, the implementation of it is still kind of working itself out. Well, I'm going to, I'll take off my be smart hat because um, we're nonpartisan and, you know, so I'm not really supposed to talk about uh, advocacy as far as be smart, but as my own personal uh, advocate for these things, um, Laura's right, there's 988, which is sort of in a limbo state right now, because my understanding is um, we're, it's a national program and it has to take uh, place starting in July of 2022. But the question is at each state, how, how do you implement it? And so here in California, we're trying to make it so that um, there are actual uh, kind of crisis units, if you call 988, that will respond that um, would be separate from law enforcement. Because sometimes, you know, obviously law enforcement, they're not always the right people to respond to these kinds of, of concerns. So I think the, the main hang up with that one right now is trying to figure out how to fund it. And I believe there's $20 million in this current budget to get it going, but um, they also wanted to put a surcharge on communications charges so that all of that has got to be worked out to, because they need more money for it. They need people to answer the phones and all, you know, people to go out and be the, the teams. So um, I think that'll go ahead, but I would just suggest if, if you are interested in this, just kind of keep an eye on it. Um, and then I would say from this secure storage standpoint, um, there was uh, AB 452. And the idea for that was that to have all uh, school districts inform their parents about the importance of safe storage of firearms. So just like, you know, you get things typically maybe about nutrition or uh, tobacco and alcohol use, they would annually inform their parents about safe storage. And that ended up turning into a two-year bill. So it's sort of on hold until the next legislative uh, session here in California. And we hope that that goes through because right now we're trying to advocate individually to every district for them to do it. And, and a lot of them are, but it's just a lot it's a bigger challenge when we have to go district by district rather than having it be a state mandate. So thanks, well, thank Daniel. You. Thank you for that information. I mean, it, it's one, once again, we we're trying to provide objective information for you all to be aware of. I mean, that's the biggest thing of all, to be educated, to know about the different issues that are popping up in your communities. And so, you know, on behalf of SDMST, thank you both to both of you. Great speaking um, with regard to the content shared today. Obviously, there is a thread that, you know, loops itself through every one of our speakers today, and it's making sure that there's a safe home, that, that there is communication around mental health, and, you know, to work towards, you know, being aware and being more cognizant of, of not only your own mental health, but those family members that you have. Um, so before we transition, I know that there was some um, aspects in the chat that I just wanted to raise uh, visibility on. Um, one of those being that um, for mental health resources, uh, and I know that it was shared, but just reiterating, uh, up to you, San Diego has a ton, a ton of great resources there. The VA, and you'll be uh, talking with the VA contact shortly, um, also has some great information about mental health and suicide uh, prevention. Um, and then, you know, once again, with those who may require more um more connection, just really want to emphasize that, you know, as we talked about today, normalizing certain aspects of mental health in terms of getting counseling and counseling services are a great opportunity. And I know Cohen Clinic was there and listed, um, but, you know, in, in times of emergency, the crisis, access and crisis line still is active to my understanding. So, you know, there's no wrong door. And, um, you know, so thanks again for those speakers coming out today. And with that, I, I actually, you know, 
would like you to know we're at the hour mark and with um, some of the information that you know uh, you've taken in please during this upcoming break think about when it comes to your own mental health and wellness um, you know how can you strive to continue to put this a part of your world even if it's not a part of um, the month, the theme of the month. So making it more of a lifestyle. So with that being said, let's take a five minute break. I'm going to cue some music and we'll get started at six after. All right, we're going to have you all come back. I know we're probably cutting your break short, so my apologies, but uh, we have some more great content to get into today, and I don't want us to be short for time. So um, that being said, I want to introduce you to our next speaker. Um, we have been talking about mental health uh, awareness as, as a topic. We've also talked about suicide prevention. Um, so you now know about a community resource for that, but we also want you to know what, what is uh, out there in the community with regard to our DOD partners. And so that being said, Kimberly, are you able to unmute? Yes. 
Yes. I Earth. didn't want to start my video until I was going <laughs> to go on. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> You're with Kimberly Beckstead. Uh, she represents VA and will tell you all about the program that they have offering. So thank you for being with us today and take it away. Sure. Okay. So you're going to do the slides then, yes? I will. Or... Just let me know next slide and we're good. Okay. So next slide, please. Uh, so I, before we get into the nuts and bolts, I just want to introduce myself. Um, again, I my name is Kimberly Beckstead. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I work at the VA um, in La Jolla, actually teleworking um, mainly. Um, we do most of our work with veterans uh, that are flagged as high risk for suicide uh, over the phone, actually. Um, and I'm part of a team called the Suicide Prevention Coordinator um, Team. Every single VA has a team of us. Um, ours is seven people big of uh, licensed clinicians. Uh, and we cover the full catchment area of San Diego County, um, and we work with uh, veterans that have been flagged as high risk for suicide. Um, and we do the flagging, um, and I can kind of just give you kind of an overarching understanding. We also respond to the veterans crisis line calls. Um, certainly we're not on 24 seven, they go to three different call centers, but um, if they identify themselves as a veteran and they're in our catchment area, then we get the consults from the responders and we follow up on them within 24 business hours and reach out. So they might be a veteran that's already flagged and known to us. They might not be. They might be a third party that we reach out to, but it's um, locally how it kind of works with the veterans crisis line is um, the SPCs at each VA follow up to either get them hooked into care, check in, crisis intervention. Um, and so I just, uh, there was a lot of information I could have potentially brought, but I thought it might be a good idea to provide some facts and information. Um, I kind of abridged a, a much longer PowerPoint from um, the VA central office. Um, I, you know, I want, um, I want you to feel like this is helpful and it, it makes sense to the things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis and, um, as Akia knows, I am kind of a fly by the seat of my pants trainer where if there's something that comes up that you're questioning or have a question about or want to learn more about, um, if I don't know the answer, I'll write it down and get back to you. And if I do, then we'll discuss it. Um, feel free to use the chat. I know there's quite a few people here, so it's probably best to do that, but I'm hoping that there'll be room for questions at the end. Um, so next slide, because there's no facts yet. Okay, so um, we actually just, just, just got the newest annual report, um, but this is this is the most up-to-date information. Um, basically, the National Veteran Suicide Prevention Annual Report. So every year we get this report, um, and it re reports on the trends in veteran suicide deaths um, from 2005 to 2018. Um, it focuses on the suicide counts and rates among various veteran subpopulations. So the data is important and the statistics are important in that it's really the only way that we have a hard and fast ability to see tangibly if what we're doing is making a difference. Uh, prevention is very hard to measure, right? Because it's hard to know what you prevented without an event. And we don't want an event in this case, right? Um, but there's a lot of... Um, a lot of care coordination, a lot of augmented specialty care that is very unique to the VA and what we offer the veterans um, in terms of the services that we do. Um, our, our role is um, sort of akin to a specialist. So we're specialists in suicidology. So if there's a doctor that's seeing a patient or a psychiatrist that's seeing a patient or an audiologist or, um, you know, any kind of medical provider that's seeing a patient where then their suicidality um, starts to kind of take over uh, their ability to do their job, right? So it's like, so say, you know, you're a primary care doctor and your patient comes in and they've really injured their knee and you realize, oh, okay, they're going to need a specialist to look at that knee because sort of out of my scope, it's hindering my ability to treat them in my general practice. Um, that's where we come in and we get consulted. Um, we get consulted by community partners and we get consulted by um, internal VA providers um, on a daily basis. So it's important to have this information so you, we can kind of measure, but I'm also a big fan of highlighting kind of what we do with boots on the ground and how techniques and ways we hope to work with the community resources that we're among um, 
to continue this important prevention work. So um, I'm not gonna go through every bullet point because you're all very smart individuals that can read, but if you see something that jumps out that's exceptionally interesting or different than you thought, um, let me know. Um, but they really do, um, you know, there's, there's specific reasons why veterans um, specifically are more um, susceptible, more vulnerable at higher risk to potentially kill themselves. Um, and there's specific reasons why. Um, okay, next slide. So there's these things called anchors of hope. Um, and it's kind of this part where, you know, silver linings, right? So, you know, in, in over 50 years of research, overwhelmingly, not just talking about veterans, but in, in society um, in general, there has not been a big switch of, you know, a decrease because now there's awareness and we're talking about it. It's really kind of stayed very static, but over the last like 15 years, what we've noticed is that, um, you know, there's, there's, little, you know, if, if you kind of peel back the layers, you can see these little successes and there's adjusted suicide rates and they've fallen among veterans with recent um, Veterans Health Administrative Care, right? So the before I worked at the VA, I didn't really understand the whole, um, you know, it, who's a veteran, right? And, and, and who counts in that statistic and who served but doesn't identify themselves as a veteran, right? So there's really out of like 20, you know, um, veterans, 14 of them are usually not engaged in v, uh, VA care at all. Um, oftentimes they can be and they could access benefits, but they believe that's, you know, a resource for people that are amputees, right? Not me. I just went for four years and I got my GI Bill. I don't want to, you know, which is unfortunate because we have some really good services. Um, but those 14 people are not being seen by us. Um, aren't on our radar and they are at high risk for suicide um, by virtue of multiple things. So we're really looking to how do we get out there and reach those 14 people um, and also keep an eye on our six, right? This is an estimate, but to really, um, you know, with VHA care where they're in our system and we're tracking them and they're potentially flagged and they get some of our specialty care for a while, um, they are you know, they're, they're, the rates are falling a little bit. So that's exciting. Um, and then the rates fell from 2005 to 2018 in those with depression, anxiety, and substance use disorders. Um, that's an interesting piece. We do kind of a annual aggregate and we log all their diagnostic data and things, but obviously someone doesn't need to be diagnosed with anything to be high risk for suicide. Um, or maybe they haven't been evaluated and would meet criteria, we don't know. But um, the veteran suicide rate did not increase significantly between 2017 and 2018. So that's another piece where if we're gonna measure the effectiveness, we wanna see if there's been any rate of change. Um, and then, um, so basically the, the support for coordinated efforts at the local, regional and national levels to implement a public health approach is really the key to ending suicide, right? So just having a conversation with my supervisor this morning about an instance where, I mean, how many of us, if you're direct practice clinicians have had people that you're working with and you can see the path ahead and you've made these referrals and you've scheduled these appointments and as back to the best of your ability followed up with them and they continue not to engage or respond or answer their phone. Um, but then they do come up when they're in crisis. And there was an um, example of this, a young veteran, a transgendered woman and, um, I just said, you know, I'm going to keep the flag on. I'm going to keep calling. And one of these days she's going to answer and I'm going to see what's going on. And I happened to get her the other day and she's doing okay. But when we did some digging, um, we realized her medications were going to expire next month. She had no idea because she hasn't been in touch with her psychiatrist. Right. Um, and then I also looked and saw that, um, she also needed to update her authorization for community care. So she's one that qualified to get care outside. And so in that, you know, it seems like kind of, wow, that's one specific um, gap filler, but that could have very well prevented a true crisis, right? And so it's these kind of um, reaching out to our community care provider, alerting and educating that person on how to get reauthorized, like all these like little tidbits come together to really get in front of a, a backslide that would then, um, elicit usually, unfortunately, a reactive approach. Okay, let's get you bandaged up, right? Let's get you bandaged up and get you back engaged because you were in crisis and you fell off the radar. Um, and so it's kind of that approach that we've been really looking at, um, starting small and, and showing a big change. 
Next slide, please. So here's um, the suicide count, um, US and adult veteran populations between those years. Um, there was a 47.1 increase in the number of suicide deaths in the general population and a 6.3% increase in the number of suicide deaths in the veteran population. So why do we think, um, and put it in the chat box um, or unmute if you're brave, I don't mind. Um, why do you think that veterans specifically are at higher risk for dying by suicide? And if there's crickets, I will just pick a name and call you out. Akia knows I will do that. Um, hi, this is Monica. Nice. Um, uh, one guess would be the, um, the culture, the military culture um, is still um, very like, I can do this, you know, suck it up, very um, um, like uh, independent. Um, so maybe seeking for help is not, it's not part of the, the, the like, culture, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yep, that, that could definitely play a role in it. Um, what else do veterans potential? Well, what do they have in common in terms of training? So I, this isn't, this isn't, tra excuse me, this isn't a training issue, but a lot of veterans are very leery of the VA um, because of the, I'm working with one right now, because of the problems of, that had been in the past. So um, I'm finding that that is his main barrier. His main barrier, just to get help period um, with his drug addiction in yeah. other yeah. things. What you bring up is very much um, a current issue in the sense that there's a lot of training that we're doing and learning about and, and attention being paid nationally through the VA of systemic betrayal. And it's kind of this sense of, you know, this system has betrayed me or this system. And this kind of goes into a, a, a bigger issue, which I don't want to open a can of worms, but like in terms of like right now, super current events, right? Like the government and the tragedies in Afghanistan and the sacrifices made, but then there's this kind of Right, so it's this overarching feeling of uh, systemic betrayal and how do we repair that as veteran you know, providers? Um, and it starts with acknowledging that that's a very valid experience to have had. And it starts with coming from like a human to human point where it's like, okay, there's, there's some bad apples, but don't let them ruin the batch. I have a great team and allow me to kind of build some trust with you, but I don't expect you to just give it to me because I work at the VA. In fact, I expect to have to earn it depending on your past experiences, right? So that's a really good point. And it's something that is very real and um, worth talking about. And there's also a lot of veterans that didn't have a great experience while active duty. And so that's a whole systemic betrayal where they came in and they had all these high hopes when I worked with active duty Marines and they would end up having you know, DUI incidents and getting administratively separated. And then it's like, oh my gosh, you've fallen from glory. We don't need you anymore, kicked out. And this is something that they thought would be a lifelong thing. So. Yeah, it's a very specific, complicated, um, unique and, and diverse population that I feel very fortunate to be able to work with. And it's really, you know, kind of the nuts and bolts piece I was alluding to with training is they have all have firearm training, right? I mean, you, you have that when you're active duty. They have access to means maybe more than the average person might. Um, they may have been exposed to trauma both while active duty and childhood trauma. So that increases their risk. They could have, you know, an extensive substance abuse problem, um, far, you know, far worse having experienced trauma while active duty and now kind of back into the world and not reintegrating well back into their family, right, after the things that they've seen or done. So those are very unique to veterans. And so it doesn't mean that every veteran you meet is like this fragile person that's about to kill themselves. It just means that they're, it's worth having a conversation about and not shying away from, hey, you know, have you, you know, just reaching out. That's the big um, push this year for Suicide Prevention Month. And it has been um, really um, relevant is reach out, go out of your way to, you know, act on spidey sense if you get the sense that somebody isn't doing well. And just asking the question of, are you okay? How are you feeling? You know, um, I noticed some changes in behavior that could go a really long way. And 
both personally and professionally um, indicate that you're a safe person to confide in. And that could be right there, the, the saving grace. I can't tell you how many times and ex, you know examples of things of like, I had the Tylenol in my hand and my friend called me back in that minute. And I just decided to take that phone call instead of doing it that night and I didn't do it. it wasn't like, and I decided I wanted to live forever, but it was this you know, time and space between means and an action. Um, and if you're, you can be that person in any capacity that you serve, I, I would highly encourage you to try. Um, but back to the data, you can tell where I prefer to talk. Um, but uh, move to the next slide. And I, I'm aware of time, so I wanna really respect your time. I've got some information to cover, but go to the next slide so I can see. I'll let you kind of, Follow those numbers on your own if it's interesting to you. We'll move to the next one. You know, I have something to add about the the weapons. Yep. Uh, this is Daniel. I'm a veteran, um, and I noticed throughout my life the people around me had an ab ab abhorrence or, or an aversion to to guns and weapons. Whereas since I used one to keep myself alive at a certain point, there's a kind of a trust and a, and, a, and a closeness that I have with weapons that could help me. And yeah. so, you know, I don't, I don't have any right now, but the idea of having one, especially when you see all the turmoil in the world, is a familiar feeling to me. And it would be something that I would feel would, would be my, something to protect me and, and almost in a sense of a friend um, if I needed it. Um, and, and so, it's also a mindset is what I'm, I'm getting at. There's a sense yeah. that this is something close to me that protects me. Um, and so that may be the other underlying reasons why people have it. They feel secure, not just from what others may do to them, but just they, they feel like this is something close to them. Right. And, and I think that's, yeah. So You know, and that is such a great point. And I'm so glad you brought that up because it's, it's a perfect example of this importance of the, the difference of perspective, right? So yes, yes. I'm a new clinician and I want, you know, I'm not, I'm not, unfortunately, I'm not the youngest clinician in the room anymore, <laughs> um, but say I am and I'm green behind the ears and I am like, which is how I was 15 years ago, like I am going to go out there and I am just, I'm going to instill hope and I'm going to protect people. And I got no training in suicide prevention. I mean, suicide assessment, barely, maybe during my internship, right? Um, I didn't know that that was the world that I would find my, my biggest passion for at the time. But here's the thing. Somebody comes in front of me and they have all these risk factors that you would find on these data points, right? It's a 74-year-old white male, owns five firearms, lives alone in a cabin at Lake Isabel, and um, has no license because he can't drive anymore. So he's really isolated, lonely, will not, you know, rigid thought process, won't ask for help. Oh, by the way, it's a real person I'm working with right now. Um, and they tell me, oh, I'm not getting rid of my firearms. And I have the ammunition and it's right next to it. I'm not gonna um, separate and I don't want a gun lock. Thank you, I don't, but you, I'm not gonna do it right now. Who knows when I will. That's extremely high risk. How many of your anxiety levels would just shoot through the roof? <laughs> yes, you're Absolutely. like, uh. yeah. oh, and I can only do things over the phone. I don't understand any smart technology. I refuse to get a smartphone and I don't have a computer. So I can't like look at this person and assess them or have them come in because they can't drive. So here's the thing. This person's perspective is, I live alone in the woods, lady. I have five guns. They make me feel safe. There's really nothing else that makes me feel safe because I'm an old person and my body feels old and I'm in pain all the time. Do not even go anywhere near what keeps me feeling safe. And how dare you, young female bleeding heart social worker, tell me <laughs> what I need to do to keep myself safe. I've got years on you. I've got, you know, experience. And then, hey, if I want to take myself out one day, guess what? It's my right to do that too. My perspective is, oh my God, you're on every single PowerPoint slide I've ever given. This is like, you are the most high risk. How do I keep you safe? How do Here's the answer. It's human behavior. It's an art and it's trusting 
your clinical instinct and knowing what the steps are to assess, to offer, to keep offering, to be consistent, to be a safe person, and to notice um, a holistic approach of our medical issues getting worse. Is there anything going on psychosocial wise? Um, so it's, it's one of these things where it's like difference of perspective. I'm gonna respect that you've had these guns for 50 years and you haven't killed yourself yet, thank God. So I'm going to respect that you can keep yourself safe. But if I get an inkling that there's any change or that I can be of any more, you know, kind of persuasive, I will keep trying. I think that's the best you can do in a situation like that. But the perspective is huge and it's important to, to try to offer it respect and not come at it with an ego that's like, I do know better than you. Have you seen the statistics? You're going to die soon. I mean, that's not helpful at all. Um, <laughs> I, I do yeah. specialize in real talk, so I'm glad that. Um, but it's it's the truth. It's it's human behavior. There's no there's no one why. Um, and to do this work, we have to be comfortable in the gray, and we have to be comfortable with um, putting trust in individuals that are high risk. Um, if we expect them to trust us, you know. So um, so I love this slide. So leave this here. From decision to action in less than an hour. The, this is extremely important for tangible prevention, like tangible prevention where, you know, people are like, um, well, why would you take away his knife? He could just literally leave his house and get a new one. Um, I would take it away right now because that would save his life for at least the next couple of hours. I'll take it because suicidal thoughts live in ambivalence. They're not a, they're not a natural thought to have for human beings. They're uncomfortable. Um, they're, stigmatized, which is not what I'm alluding to, but they're not a natural thought to have. And so you might catch someone with a live die ratio of, of I want to live 5% and I want to die 95% today. And then you say, okay, where is that knife? Let's get rid of the knife. Fine. I'll give it to my neighbor, whatever. You call them two hours later, they could have gone and gotten another knife, but their favorite show came on and they realized that their friend called them back. So I'm good. I'll get the knife from her tomorrow and think about it tomorrow. That's a win. They're breathing. They're taking it another day. So it's really looking at this, you know, impulsive action to escape overwhelming emotions and feeling trapped. And um, also with just kind of keeping them safe from themselves to kind of wait it out for it to pass. Um, and it looks, you know, percentage of attempters in less than five minutes from a thought to a decision and an action, 24%. Less than 20 minutes went by, 48%. And then within the hour of having a thought and an action, 71%. So this is a really important um, thing to remember that you're not trying to take away their ability to do it ever in their life in one sitting, but maybe for today or maybe for the next hour, and then your safety planning with them moving forward on how to continue that decision to breathe. Um, next slide. So this is just a, if you're into these kinds of graphs, um, just kind of the, the reported suicides um, by week. And this is also too, I just wanna remind you that these are things that are ruled by the medical examiner's offices as suicide death by suicide. Um, there may be numbers that we've missed. There may be numbers that are counted that were incorrectly categorized. It really just depends. So I just always like to rattle the cage a bit about statistics on they're not a, a black and white thing, but overall, this is kind of a good glimpse. Next. And then this is the new suicide attempters non-fatal by week. Um, obviously a firearm is going to, the lethality of that is potentially a lot more fatal than a, an overdose, depending on what. Um, and then I'm trying to keep um, track of the chat, but I realized I missed a bunch. Um, okay, so this is something, you know, for all of you to look at. Um, 91 veterans with depression are alive in 2018, 146 of them had anxiety in their life. Um, Yeah, I love this last one, 49,000 projective lives spared from exposure to suicide. Um, 
So it's just important that we look at this also. Um, let me see, does the VA offer any type of programs that help with PTSD trauma release other than counseling? I, I mean, yes, there's TMS. Um, do you know what TMS is? Trans magnetic stimulation, I wanna say. Um, and there's, um, um, I don't know. It'd probably be the, the only thing outside of counseling I'm aware that we offer other than obviously like trauma focused therapy, but I know I'm getting off on a side squirrel. Okay, I'll answer those questions in a little bit. Okay, next one. It's preventable, we know this. So this is just an easy way um, to kind of cap it, put it all together in an acronym because we all love acronyms so much, but the um, signs of suicidal thinking should be recognized. So any little inkling, um, I remember training active duty, their first favorite thing to say that they learned from a training is like, what's a warning sign someone's going to kill themselves? They give their stuff away. Okay, or they're having a garage sale. Not all the time, but good on you for noticing a potential sign. So anything that's a change in behavior that gives you the kind of sense that, hey, I wanna ask how they're doing. Um, then you ask how the most important question of all. Um, you either are, hey, have you ever thought about wanting to die? A lot of times people that have gone through what you went through have thought about suicide. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, you'd be surprised within 20 seconds of sight unseen, they don't know me from Adam when I call a veteran that has been flagged as high risk and I explain who I am and I say, so how you doing? Talk to me about your mood. Um, have you thought about suicide lately? They don't even flinch. Yeah, yesterday. It always, always surprises me. I'm speaking their language. I'm normalizing it because it's what I talk about every day, but it's also like, hey, I'm a safe person to admit this to and give me some more information about how you think about life and death and everything in between. Um, and then you validate that experience. You know, there's been a lot of times where I have said, holy hell, if I had gone through what you have just told me, I would be under a rock somewhere. How are you still getting up, dressing up, showing up? Like that is amazing. You need, I need to understand more about your resilience. And I will tell you over and over again, when I do that, when it's truly a, a, an authentic response of mine of like, wow, you have been through it. They're like, you are the first person that I've worked with that hasn't tried to tell me what was good about what I just said that could be hopeful. And you just said I was went through some shit. And that helps me that you acknowledged that I went through it. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's validating the veterans experience in whatever way it comes authentically to you. Um, and then encouraging treatment and expedite getting help, kind of demystifying what that looks like. Um, in your situation, when you brought up the veteran that feels betrayed by the system, right? And the lack of trust, validate that experience. I can totally understand why you would do that. But let me give you an example of someone that had a completely different experience or this lady that came and talked and cussed a couple of times when I was on this, you know, meeting with a bunch of professionals, she might be somebody you'd want to talk to at the VA. Um, you know, find your people and hold them close, you know, um, and then expedite getting help as best you can. Go the extra mile and contact your contact who has a contact to get past the red tape. Um, 4.30 on a Friday, I know you want to get home to your, you know, your kids. I've got three of my own. My youngest is one. Um, my oldest is six, right? I've got a whole other life happening outside of my office, <laughs> as we all do, but it's important that I stay engaged and expedite and be that kind of catalyst to connect as much as I possibly can. Um, because who knows, you might be the first person within a system that ever took the time and didn't say, oh, okay, here's a number, call that. Here, text this. Have you ever heard of the Veterans Crisis Line? Yeah, go ahead and call them. They'll get you connected to an operator. The VCL is wonderful. The responders are amazing. I always educate my veterans. My goodness, my business day ends at five. I can't be there for you 24 seven, but the VCL is, the Veterans Crisis Line is, and you can call them. And as long as you are completely open with not being at acute risk, you will not get surprise visitors at your door and you could talk to them as long as you want. Three in the morning, call them. That's a huge prevention. Chat with them online, text them. I put the text number in the chat because I noticed before I went on, someone asked about it. And yes, they need a referral for TMS. I just noticed that. Um, I think these are kind of nuts and bolts. You can go over what you do and what you don't want to do. Um, we've already kind of gone through that. Remember that though, if that's something that'll help you kind of 
as you're in a moment where your heart's pounding and this person is at high risk and you're feeling like, uh oh, it, my supervisor left, I don't have another kind of clinical mind to bounce this off of. If you want to remember these things, then you've already kind of developed a helpful structure for yourself and that can ease your own anxiety as a provider. That's the other thing we do is we consult all day with providers throughout the VA. Um, you know, on our instant messaging that we have internally at the VA, you know, a psychiatrist will be like, ah, so-and-so came in, he said this, he left without me getting this, what should I do, what do I need? And we're there as a consult service as well. Next, I think we're good, I think we're done. I, I do know I went over time, but I'm hoping it was helpful. Um, and these are cool, yeah, so if you, you could take this training online, you could offer this to people you supervise, you could offer it to your, you know, it's just to kind of, um, sharpen up your skills when it comes to suicide assessment, asking the question, and this is certainly not just for veterans. Um, these questions would apply to any human being that might be in a, in a place of crisis. Um, where can you post the VCL information again? V VCS, I'm assuming you mean VCL. Yes. Um, and then this, so you have it in this PowerPoint slide though. So this is really cool, Veterans and Military Crisis Line. I mean, I'm telling you, I had no idea the breadth of work that we do um, in terms of this. And, you know, they're identified as a veteran if they press one. If they don't press one, they still, you know, it's a universal crisis line. So it's important. Um, it's great when they identify themselves as a veteran because then we get the heads up and we follow up locally. And that's a huge way that we plug people in or at least do a needs assessment right off the bat, help them get hooked up with enrollment. I mean, the whole bureaucratic system of getting linked up with the VA could just be a barrier in itself. Um, and they might not know the first place to go and we could receive them that way and get them connected. Um, yeah, so more than 400 SPCs are nationwide. So I'm an SPC um, and there's teams of us, like I said, at every single VA. Um, at the medical center. We work closely with vet centers, but they are not, we don't have access to their medical records, but we um, are, we consult with them on high risk veterans that prefer to maybe get counseling there. Um, and they're all over the community as well. Um, what else? Go to the next one. So that's just a resource for you, um, how you can locate resources. Let's see the next. And these are just some, you know, I, it's awesome that there's so many trainings out there, but it's also overwhelming in itself of what to access and what might be helpful and then time management with actually doing it justice and learning it and then practicing it. Um, but my favorite is just this kind of high, high impact learning where you go back and whoever else took this training in three months, you give a case example of how you used what you learned in this training and how it affected your approach. Um, or a private consult group or, you know, a colleague. Um, I want to say that's pretty much it. Well, thank you, Kimberly. There's a ton of great resources that you shared. I want everyone to know that with regard to Kimberly's presentation and the other presenters, uh, please know that we'll do our best to make sure that you can download the uh, PowerPoint presentation today online. Um, and if you need it immediately, you're welcome to email myself or Mary. We have all the content there. But a big thank you, Kimberly. And I think the biggest, you know, thing that I appreciate that you do, that you've done is you made it real. You know, you you've shared kind of like what you're seeing. And that's what we always hope our presenters are able to kind of see because as a collaborative, we want to be mindful that what walks through our doors is might you know, be the same thing that you already talked about. So as providers, you know, just a realization that a lot of the, the information that was shared is definitely something that we don't want you just to keep to yourselves. Please share among your team and your staff and your loved ones. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's the more the more who know about it, the better. Um, so. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, one more thing I just want to plug, since you are all part of the community, just very specifically to San Diego. Um, again, I worked down the street from the VA hospital for six years and didn't know anything about what was really there in La Jolla. But um, first is, if you're meeting with a new person, ask if they're a veteran. So that's like the number, like ask, right? Because not everyone's going to wear it on their sleeve or a hat, right? Um, second, Every veteran that ever, anyone that had a uniform on there, they can come into the hospital on two north. There's something called a psychiatric emergency clinic. 
they can walk into that psychiatric emergency clinic Monday through Friday. Um, it is not the ER. It is a psychiatric emergency clinic. They check in and then they can be seen same day, maybe after a wait, maybe not, um, by a mental health professional for a medication evaluation for you know various things that are very specific to psychiatric emergencies. There's the emergency department, obviously. And then um, we have gun locks available to any veteran at any police, VA police kiosk. You go up and say, hey, I need a couple gun locks. No questions asked, here you go. Um, I've made that available. Um, not every clinic has a police presence, but the big ones do. So Mission Valley, Oceanside, the, the hospital. So these are very like specific things that I want to spread like wildfire. Um, because you know, people that work in an urgent care at a community hospital, they don't know that there's a psychiatric emergency care clinic, you know, at the VA hospital. We try to get the word out there, but it's really, you know, person specific. So as much information as you can spread and educate, the better, because um, you know, making those connections and getting them where they can get the best resources for their needs is is pretty paramount. So with that, I, I thank you so much for having me. Um, and please, um, you know, reach out, email. I, I'm pretty sure my information is available, but if it's not readily, I can, I'm happy to share it. So my work phone, my work email is, is open for all. Thank, well, thank you for you, the work yeah. that you do. Yeah, no, likewise, ditto, as they say. So um, yeah, please, once again, you know, share contact information and understand that you know, there's no wrong door to any of the stuff that we covered today. I know my internet may be glitchy, so I'll drop my video. Um, but I want to emphasize that we understand today's content. Um, obviously, it's heavy stuff, and um, it may have been triggering. You may need to hit reset to restart kind of your next part of the day. So uh, we're going to skip our, our wellness activity today, but um, welcome you to do that before you get started on your next um, portion of the day. We're gonna just generally wrap um, with what we have uh, for SEMFC announcements. Um, as always, we have our Feel Good Fridays, uh, our ways for you to connect or interact with us via social media dropping in October. Uh, there is MTSE and uh, what I wish my parents knew, uh, action team meetings also in the month of October. There's a workshop for our transitional uh, spouse transition workshops. Um, so see that information on October 19th please register in advance. A uh, reminder once again, that SEMFC's annual summit is on October 22nd. We will be um, setting out information on the program next week. And in November, we're gonna have our next portion of what I wish my parents knew, so stay tuned. So with that being said, I am so sorry to say that we're over time and I appreciate those able to stay on. I want to uh, ask you for the next slide, if you can actually um, just email me any of the information that you might have for community announcements. As a reminder for all, we drop our newsletters on the 1st and 15th of every month. And so please, we ask that you share your information with us. If we don't get it in the newsletter, we get it on our social media. So uh, Mary, I know dropped earlier the information in the chat uh, with regard to our post survey. Um, and so please take just a few seconds and accomplish that if you haven't done so already. And then one last reminder is that next month is the annual summit. We will not have any other convenings until January, if you can believe that. Um, and so with, uh, with those who we, we may be uh, dropping um, off with, I just want to appreciate your, your time and say thank you and ask you to pay it forward as we hop into the next step. And with regard to um, the e-newsletters, you're welcome to send myself an email or Mary an email, or there is a join button at the upper right-hand corner of the STMFC website. There you'll have information about um, how to sign up for our newsletter when you hit join. So um, that being said, thanks again for tuning in. I know we're a little bit old, uh, over time today, so thanks again. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and happy early fall for those who are looking at seasons. San Diego, perhaps not as much, but um, we'll hopefully start seeing a little cooling trend in the near future. And I look forward to seeing a lot of you at our annual summit next month. All right, you enjoy, have a wonderful close out to your day. And uh, as always, stay safe and hope to see you then.